Hello, welcome to the self-learning platform by Dr. Shishma Singh. Today we start Unit 14, Communist Thought, M. N. Roy and E. M. S. Namudri Path. And our topic of discussion is Communist Party of India after independence. Years after its, for its formation, the Communist Party of India sought to strengthen its position in the trade unions, organizing them, guiding them, and propagating Marxism and Leninism so as to prepare them for revolutionary struggle against the nationalist burgeois and the imperialistic capitalistic forces. In the sphere of trade union movement, the Communist Party of India, CPI, did achieve definite success by making inroads in the workers' bodies. Therefore, in 1930s, it was able to have its influence among the peasants and workers. As the labor movement gained ground, the activities of the workers, peasants and political parties including the CPI became more intensified. In 1930s, the CPI adopted a united front from above by aligning itself with the nationalist movement, but it kept its separate identity among the workers and the peasants. The CPI, as it was a banned organization, came closer to the Congress and numerous communists joined the Indian National Congress, INC, and formed a socialist group within the Congress, which came to be known as the Congress Socialist Party, CSP. They remained in the Congress until 1939, when they were expelled on the issue of double membership. With the Axis power Germany invading the Soviet Union in 1941 during the World War II and with the Soviet Union joining the Allied powers, the situation of Indian communists became precarious. The ban on the CPI by the Britishers in India were lifted and the CPI which was until then considering the 1939 war, Burji's war, began not only the suffering war, but also declared it as the people's war against the fascists. The CPI did not support the 1942 Quit India movement. Professor Verma, modern Indian political thought, has stated that when the Congress leaders following the 1942 Quit India Resolution were in jail and the foreign government was following a ruthless policy of repression, suppression and terrorization of all nationalist forces, the communists strengthened themselves and claimed to have 30,000 members, while in 1942 the party had only 2,500 members. During the war, the communists cleverly established their control over the All India Trade Union Congress also. The communists were divided over the question of independence of the country, which was only a couple of months away, especially after the formation of the interim government headed by 
Jawaharlal Nehru. They were pledged by questions such as was the country really free? Was the transfer of power national or real? Should the CPI support Nehru's Congress? In the debate within the CPI, P.C. Joshi thought that the transfer of power and independence were real and that the Nehru government should be supported. On the other hand, B.T. Randiv and Dr. Adhikari held the view that the independence was not real and that real independence could be achieved only under the leadership of CPI and that the CPI, instead of supporting the Nehru Congress government, should fight against it. The opposite view also believed in harmony with the Soviet theory that India only appeared to be independent within the framework of a modified imperialistic system. That is why in the second party congress held in Kolkata 1948, the CPI accepted Stalin's view of two camps, the capitalist and the communist, and therefore attacked imperialism, federalism, as well as the Burzi's Congress. B.T. Ranadiv replaced P.C. Joshi as the General Secretary of the CPI. Next topic is the Communist Party of India after independence. And subtopic is towards parliamentary strategy. With relatively a more militant left, the CPI immediately after independence adopted a united front tactic from below, aligning itself with the workers and peasants against the Indian National Congress. Now the CPI strategy was on course of a revolution with strikes, spotties, and violence. For Ranadiv, following the Soviet line, the working class was an instrument of revolution. He discounted the peasant uprising in the Telangana region, much to the annoyance of the Andhra Pradesh communist, even at the cost of losing office of the general secretary of the CPI. Rajeshwar Rao became the general secretary of CPI in 1950. With the shift of the Nehru government towards the former Soviet Union, the CPI was officially advised to abandon adventurous tactics and to adopt the policy of contesting parliamentary elections. Moderates like P.C. Joshi, S.C. Dang, and Ajoy Ghosh welcomed the policy shift and Politburo of the General Committee drew up a draft calling for a creation of a broad anti-federal and anti-imperialistic front embracing the national burzis. The path of the parliamentary strategy was clear. Ajoy Ghosh became the general secretary of the CPI in 1951. The CPI moved from 1950 onwards to a process of gradual change from a class conflict approach to class alliance, from revolutionary strategy to parliamentary strategy. The 1957 Lok Sabha elections saw the viceroy of the Communist Party of India in Kerala and later on 
forming the government. The fifth extraordinary congress of the CPI held in Amritsar, April 1958, maintained that though it was not possible to achieve success through peaceful and democratic means, yet the parliamentary road to socialism was not altogether infeasible. Let us discuss towards division from within. The dismissal of Kerala Communist government in 1959 made the CPI's relations with the Congress strained. The Chinese invasion of India in 1962 made polarization rather evident in the CPI beyond any repair. The right faction headed by S. A. Dang recognized the Indian claims to the territories occupied by the Chinese in 1962. The left faction of the CPI regarded the rights plea as the betrayal of the international proletariat unity. A centrist group led by the EMS Namudripad and Ajay Ghosh blamed both the Indian and the Chinese leader for the border conflict. In 1962, the balance Ajoy Ghosh died. Dang became the chairman of the CPI and EMS Namudripad the general secretary. It was, however, a short-lived unity. As the split of the international communist movement became clear with the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China taking opposite strengths, the division of CPI could no longer be delayed. The CPI became closer to the former USSR and CPI Marxist to the People's of Republic. The Soviet Union recognized the CPI as India's legitimate communist party. The CPI attributed the split of the Chinese mechanization. The CPI, M, though neutral on the ideology issue, came to be dubbed as hostile to the Soviet position. But even the Chinese distanced themselves from the CPI M. The two communist parties remain divided on certain issues. The CPI, by adopting the National Democratic Front strategy, thought of aligning itself with the Indian National Congress, which the CPI regarded as the vehicle of Burzi's nationalism. The CPI, M, by adopting the People's Democratic Government strategy, thought of remaining away from the Congress, which it regarded as an anathema. In the coming years, the CPI came to be associated with the Congress and its laurels and failures came to be counted with those of the Congress. The Congress began losing ground votes and legislative seats after 1977, accepting being the brief spell in 1980. So did the CPI. In the meantime, the CPIM became popular both with the urban and rural poor and was successful in forming government in Kela and West Bengal.
नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इज टूवर्ड्स कॉपरेशन ऑफ द कम्युनिस्ट फोर्सेस आइडियोलॉजिकली द टू कम्युनिस्ट पार्टीज रिमेन अपार्ट द सीपीआई अलाइनिंग विद नेशनलिस्ट बुर्जीज फोर्सेस व्हाइल द सीपीआई एम वर्किंग इट्स ओन स्ट्रेटजीज ऑफ पीपल्स डेमोक्रेटिक गवर्नमेंट ऑन द क्वेश्चन ऑफ सीनो सोवियत डिफरेंसेस द सीपीआई सपोर्टेड the soviet union and cpim while disapproving the soviet position did not however support china either on the border issue between india and china the cpi's position is that china should vacate the indian territories while the cpim favors a mutually agreed formula on the border issue with the cpi on the decline especially after the disintegration of soviet union as a single state the two communist parties are drawing closer to each other and now coming up with a united front election manifesto in fact the two communist parties have not had much of differences on economic demands both condemned the monopoly capitalist strategy both disapprove of the role of multinational companies in india's economy both seek to strengthen socialist measures both demand social security legislation in favor of the workers and the peasants both in general are functioning in spite of their revolutionary marxist basis primarily as socialist oriented democratic parties within the parliamentary democratic framework now we want to wind up this lecture thank you so much for your attention